Well, I just want to thank you guys so much for coming back to our show here now together. And I've got the privilege, you know, of having Pastor Jerry Bizanson here with me today. And if if that name sounds familiar, it's because um, if you watched our interview uh, with uh, Peter Henniger, he mentioned Pastor Jerry. And then if you um, had the chance to watch uh, Valley Alive, we did a show uh, sort of featuring what Pastor uh, Bruce Patstone does um, sort of monthly now, I think, in the valley, at least when the weather's good. And uh, Pastor Jerry, he spoke there. So it, when you're done with this uh, interview, you can go and check out uh, his ministry, him preaching, uh, right there on that that uh, sort of a snippet that we did uh, on Valley Alive. And beyond that, he's a pastor at a church in Greenwood. He's got a testimony that he's going to share, but I'm not. I'm going to ask him not to stop uh, once he's done with this testimony because my dad. Now, my dad's a, a huge testimony guy, Pastor. He loves testimonies, and and he could just that he could just solid hear people's mm-hmm. salvation experience. And uh, I'm there. I love that. Yeah. But when somebody's got something to say in Christ too, not only what they've come out of, but what God has shared with them for the body, I love that. Yeah. And so I'm just going to ask him when he's done um, kind of telling us his story and how he met the Lord and all this, how God found him and, uh, you know, in, in, in the experience that he's been through. And it's, it's, it's pretty incredible. I'm going to ask him to also tell us where he thinks uh, the body is at. And I know it's going to be a real brief thing, but um, I want him to do that too, because I think Mm. there's a wealth uh, that people need to hear about the future. People need to hear about uh, what's coming down the pipes for God's people. And uh, he does that through his servants through people that he calls, whether it's a prophet or a pastor or what, what you know, whatever gifting it is, right. it reveals things uh, to people who are gifted and called. And, that, and this man is called in the ministry, and I want to hear that too. So not just what he's been through, which is a miracle from God, but also what God's speaking to him for today. So, um, Pastor, now I want to say one thing too before he speaks. I have been at uh, meetings where young men have come up to him right in front of me, (laughs) thanking him for the work that they have done, uh, that God has done in their lives through him, Mm. telling him that they are now looking to go into ministry. And these are men from prison. That's right. Okay, where he was a chaplain. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about ministry that, guys, this is producing fruit, Mm. okay? And you already know at the end of this uh, interview, you can reach him at the email that's going to be provided underneath. If you'd like to ask him to come speak at your church or at your men's meeting or whatever fellowship you may have, you can just immediately write him. And uh, and if we get any of those emails sent to, to ours, we'll immediately uh, pass that right off to him, okay? So, Pastor, your story, how did you find the Lord? What happened? Well, I'll start with... Um... I'm the youngest of six children, or six mm-hmm. siblings. And um, our family originated from New Ross, okay. so sure. Yeah. My father met my mom in, Annapol- in the Annapolis Valley in Ellsford. They married, and he moved from New Ross to the Annapolis Valley. Yeah. My dad's background when he was a young man... Uh, comes down, comes out around the time of the rum, rumming, rum, okay, rum yeah, days, right, uh, on the South Shore, and yeah. um, he had been involved in some of that. Yeah, moved to the valley, um, bought a little home, and he started a small salvage business of old cars. Yeah, and bootlegging. Yeah, that was his main staple for uh, raising six kids and, and a wife. Yeah, and so. Um, I grew up with a lot of um, alcohol and things like that and drugs around um, in my upbringing. Yeah. And, of course, what comes with that is violence. Yeah. And what comes with that is the dysfunction that um, alcohol and drugs can cause. So, yes. um, 1971, 
my mother, she was murdered by a next door neighbor. Oh my dear. He was on parole and uh, was a good friend of the family. Um, but something went awry that night and, yeah. um, uh, she died as wow. at his hands oh, no. and he was never convicted. He never did time for it in prison. And so I grew up with a real, um, disdain for authority, uh, for the law. Yeah. Um, and, and so I began to act out. Um, I remember my mom's funeral and the, and the minister came along, the priest and, um, tap me on the head, oh, you know, little Jerry, you know, everything's going to be okay. Giving you empty, false words of hope, yeah. you know, and, uh, and my, well, my whole family, my dad were in tears, but I had stopped crying. Yeah. And I remember things sort of stopped up inside of me, went cold. Yeah. In those last couple of days, um, leading up to my mom's funeral. And I cursed at the minister. Yeah. And then I cursed at God. My mom taught me when I was a child to believe in God, yeah. to believe that good things will happen. Follow the Lord in your life. She taught me how to pray. Wow. And, um, and uh, though she and my dad were both um, what I understand today to be alcoholics, mm -hmm. um, um, yet she never left her childhood face. She remembered. And so things got really critical and really bad in our family. Yeah. And I remember at those nights she would tuck me in and she would teach me to pray and talk to the Lord and believe in God. And we'd talk about faith. Wow. And so she was somehow, even in her struggle, yeah. she felt the necessity at this stage of her yeah. life. Yeah. And at least with me, the youngest, the yeah. last of the children, uh, that she felt to instill yeah. some hope, some seeds of hope and, and faith. Yeah. And uh, I didn't think that it taken at the time. Yeah. And so after my mom's funeral, I, I, I mean, my first drink was of alcohol. I was 10 years old. Yeah. Wow. And it just progressed more so after that, then into the marijuana, acid, things like that, and hashish. Yeah. And uh, I was running with a crowd that was twice my age. Yeah. So I'm looking up to my peers, which are 20, 23, 24, 25 years old, and I'm 12, 13, 14 when I'm, I'm out on the streets. Yeah. And um, I started breaking enters, yeah. uh, just not really needing any of the things that I was stealing, uh, cartons of cigarettes and bottles of liquor from cabinets and so on, and yeah. coins, collection, uh, coin collections from homes, yeah. and any loose cash I could find anywhere. Yeah. And uh, what I would pick up, I would sell if I could for, or trade it for drugs or what have you on the street. Yep. So break and enter became a, a, a main way of life to survive yeah. in my addiction that was developing very quickly. Yeah. And over the next seven years, it progressed from simple break and enters to robberies, armed robberies. Wow. And uh, eventually um, I was convicted for committing uh, a murder during a robbery. Wow. And uh, I ended up spending... Uh, almost 11 years in penitentiary. Yeah. Now, leading up to that time, I was five years after that last criminal act event. Yeah. Um, that five years out on the street, avoiding authorities. Yeah. Um, and, and so, but in that five years, some wonderful things begin to happen in my yeah. life. Yeah. Some incredible things happen in my life. Um, I knew in back of my mind, as, as months progressed after that last time, that last crime yeah. that I had not yet been caught for, that somewhere, somehow, things had to stop. Yeah. I just didn't know how to stop it. I tried to quit drinking, tried to quit the drugs, yeah. tried to break away from the old uh, influences, uh, but I just couldn't seem to find the strength, the power to break the cycle more than every two or three weeks, and I'd be right back to it again. Yeah. And... Uh, um, in the period of that time, I met a woman. Her name was Kim. We were boyfriend and girlfriend. We started dating yeah. teenagers and um, grew up in the same community, small little village. And um, we dated for over a year. And then one night she came home from a Peter Youngren uh, yeah. revival tent meeting service in Halifax, Nova Scotia, or Sackville, Nova Scotia. Yeah. And she was telling me about the wonderful experience she had. She had given her life to Jesus. And I'm thinking, oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> this sounds like things could change. <laughs> and did it ever. Yeah, I'll bet. <laughs> uh, everything changed in our relationship. You know, yeah. things got cleaned up. And, yeah. and we had a sense of morality, you know. And, and um, wrong was no longer right. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Right on. And so... 
um, I remember she one night I was going to pick her up and we were going to go out for a date. Yeah. And um, she was telling me all about Jesus, you know. And I said, look, I said, I'm not going to meet you tonight. I've got the boys in the car. We're, we got a, case, a couple cases of liquor, a few bottles, some weed. We're going to the pool hall. We're having a night out tonight. Yeah. And she says, you've got to stop, Jerry. You've got to stop this way of life. Something bad's going to happen. Yeah. Ah, uh, you know. And so I, I just kind of blew it off. And that night as I was leaving their apartment, uh, her, her home, yeah. uh, she just said one more time, she says, Jerry, you need Jesus. Yeah. And I pushed her against the wall and I said, you make a decision right now. It's either me or Jesus. Yeah. Our relationship or religion. Yeah. And she cried and cried. She said, please, please do not force me. Please don't make me make this decision. Yeah. And I thought, yeah, I, I got her where I want her, right? Yeah. And um, she said, it has to be Jesus. I wow. said, what'd you say? <laughs> what'd you say, woman? And she said, it has to be Jesus. Wow. And her heart was broken. Yeah. And I said, we're done. And I walked out the door. And for over the next six months, I went really, really wild. Yeah. In uh, drinking, drugs, parties, girls, um, stealing, robberies, what have you. Yeah. And uh, I sat in October 1977 behind my father's house. Now, up to this point, I was living out on the street at times, sleeping in my car, sleeping in other people's cars. Yeah. Uh, I was out about two years on the streets. Okay. And it's rough living on the street. You know, today we have an epidemic of, of people living on the streets, yeah. homeless. Yeah. And we're talking not just about people like myself that were into the drugs or the crime scene, yeah. but families. Oh, yeah. Families. And it's just never, we never thought we'd see yeah. such a thing happen. You're right. Not in, in Nova Scotia, no. not in Canada, but it's everywhere. It's everywhere. Because of this post pandemic yeah. situation, I, I suppose. And so living on the streets or being homeless is it makes things a lot more hopeless and, and, and the despair is, is so widespread within your soul yeah. that you can't see your, your past, your, your now, your situation, your plight, your yeah. despair. You can't see any hope. You don't feel any hope. Yeah. And I was in that place. And so in October 1977, I'd been staying at my dad's for a couple of weeks again yeah. until I get kicked out or I would walk out and leave. And, and, and um, that's, a, that's still at New Ross. No, no. Oh, okay. My dad moved from New Ross, met my mom in Elsford in the valley okay. and started. The I'm sorry. Okay. Right. And right. Bootlegging in the valley. Okay. Yeah. And that's where I was being raised. Yeah. And, um, and met my, my girlfriend, now my wife today. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I took my rifle down off the rack that my dad had bought for me when I was a teenager. <laughs> and um, I loaded, I put one bullet in the chamber, grabbed a bottle of beer out of the refrigerator rolled a joint walked back through the field wrote in the country and down to the old fishing hole where i used to fish as a kid and i thought you know uh when the police catch up with me with all the stuff i've done and got away with i'll go away forever mm. and that's just not going to happen yeah and i smoked that joint and i'm looking at the colorful leaves and on the hardwood trees by the by the brook and you hear the brook running and, and the birds were singing and I'm thinking, yeah, this is it. Mm. This this is the end of the line. This I'm taking charge of my life. No, they won't catch me. I'm not going to prison. My girlfriend, she's gone. I knew nothing good would ever happen with my life. I always had a very negative outlook on life and mm. uh, never considering that I was contributing yeah. <laughs> a large part yeah. of that. Yeah. And um, yeah. <laughs> I, I drank that one bottle of beer, so yeah. I wasn't drunk. And one joint certainly wasn't high because I was used to smoking, token, drinking all the time. Yeah. Put my thumb on the trigger and I heard somebody's voice and I knew it wasn't my dad, mm. but I looked over my shoulder up out of the meadow towards our home across the field. Nobody was there. And what I heard was Jerry. That's all I heard, Jerry. And I kind of shook it off. And I went back to this focus of, I, I'm, I'm going to do this. I'm ending my life here today. Mm -hmm. Second attempt, and I heard, Jerry, you doesn't have to end this way. And I look around again, and I'm looking down to the brook and through the trees. And I'm thinking, man, am I losing my mind? I know I heard this. Mm. Who is it? And I hollered out, who's there? Who's there? No reply. I closed my eyes. 
is it. This is it. And I heard the third time an audible voice. Mm. Jerry, it doesn't have to end this way. Mm. Well, I want to tell you, I didn't figure it out. I didn't understand what was happening. I believe today it was the Spirit of God speaking to my heart. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And I jumped up. Mm. And I took the rifle with me, dropped the empty bottle of a uh, beer bottle, and back up over the field to my house. Um, my dad was out in the yard down by the salvage yard and uh, working on his truck. I went in, put the, uh, popped the bullet out of the chamber, put it in the box, put the rifle back up, drank a couple of beer, sitting there looking down that long dirt country road uh, through, the kit, through the kitchen window mm. and I'm trying to figure out what just happened. Yeah. Two weeks to that day, it was a Sunday morning mm. in 1977, month of October. Two weeks from that Sunday morning, I received a, a phone call from my ex-girlfriend. Mm. And she said, Jerry, we're going to church this morning. Would you go with us? I hung up on her. Second phone call came, and I just cursed her out, cursed her out. I'm not going to church with you. It was her dad. <laughs> it, we were good buddies. He was a yeah. Montreal Canadiens fan. I was, I was a Montre diehard, uh, diehard Montreal Canadiens yeah. fan. And and we spent a lot of evenings, you know, uh, with Ron McLean. And, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. The, John Cherry. John Cherry <laughs> and uh, watching hockey and, yeah. and drinking coffees and yeah. uh, jokes and laughs and, and so on. And I really respected my my ex-girlfriend's dad yeah and he was a local businessman in the community well respected yeah and um and he and his wife also got saved that summer when my girlfriend got saved wow and there was 20 of them in the community that had gotten saved some business people some of their friends some of their family members there was a sweeping through in the annapolis valley in those days uh, of the Spirit of God that that reached souls, knocked on doors and homes, and visited people's bedrooms, wow. and people's lives were transformed and changed through their testimony. Wow! As business people, yes, and, um, they were involved in some things I can't mention. Sure, but they made it clear to their associates, their friends, their neighbors, family, that those things are now a thing of the past. Yes. We're walking with Jesus. Amen. And so they, they took it they took a real stand up approach to yeah. their faith and they 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 suffered for it. Yeah. And so uh, but they were true to the Lord. And that impacted me as well because Clinton, her Kim's dad, yeah. um this good friend, a man who you know was a good good friend to me, yeah, uh, treated me like a dad would treat a son. Yeah. And he always wanted a son, apparently, but he yeah. had three girls. Okay. So I was maybe a little bit sort of the son he never had. Sure. And um, so anyways, what happened was um, I said to Clinton, I'm sorry, I, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I didn't realize it was you. Yeah. And he said, just will you go with us to church this morning? Even just the once. Jerry, you don't know what you're missing. Yeah. I said, Clinton, I'm an atheist. I don't believe in God. I know you don't. But would you go with us just the once anyway, just for me? Yeah. And I was like, oh man, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and he had this big old four fifty four big block, yeah, suburban. And he pick up people always in the community, take them to church. Yeah. And um, if he had to make two trips, he would. Yeah. And so I hop in the back seat with him and uh, with his uh, daughters and yeah. uh, their boyfriends and so on. Off to church we go. And that morning, the preacher was preaching a message. Yeah. He was from Newland. Never met him before in my life. He never met me. Yeah. And the things I had done, nobody knew. I lived a totally different life, you see, at night yeah. you know, from the day. And that morning, they were singing and dancing, and hands were raised, a little Pentecostal church out in the country. Mm. And and uh, the preacher steps up, and he starts preaching a message on the rapture of the church, the second coming of Christ. Mm. You know, the day is coming. If we don't get rapture, you know, the church rapture of the church is coming, mm. and then Christ is going to return by the saints of God to set up his kingdom here on earth. Mm. And I don't remember everything he said, but he stopped preaching, and he just closed his Bible. Mm. And he looked down over the congregation. He said, folks, you have to apologize to you this morning. I can't finish my sermon. Mm. He And there were seven of us new people there, young people that morning, Captain, my ex-girlfriend, her sister's boyfriend, what have you. Mm. So he didn't know who was who. Mm. He said, there's someone in the house this morning, and you're going to know who you are. He said, I have a word for you this morning. 
He says, whoever's that one person in this congregation today, and he says, you're going to know who you are mm. when I speak and release this word. He said, the, the Lord just spoke to me, and I had my biker boots on, my leather jacket, long hair, sunglasses on in yeah. church, yeah. and my feet were on the front pew in front of me. <laughs> okay. Like I was arrogant, arrogant, yeah. just totally disrespectful. Yeah. Um, this unlaw-abiding un individual. And... Um, and I hollered out, my, my ex was sitting beside me on the end of the row, and I said, I didn't hear nobody speak, or any, I didn't hear him say that. Like, the Holy Spirit, he said, the Holy Spirit just spoke to me. And I just mocked. And my poor ex-girlfriend, she just both slid down underneath the seat. Yeah. He ignored me, and he spoke it over the congregation. He said, you know who you are. Three things the Lord just spoke to me this morning. And this is what the Bible teaches about the gifts of the Spirit. Yeah. And one of them is a word of knowledge. Yeah. It is not to embarrass, but it is to reveal and uncover the hidden things. Right. So that we might be convicted by the Spirit of God and know that God is real and that God loves us and He's made a way of provision for salvation yes. and an escape from the lives that we have and the patterns of life that we've gotten ourselves into. Yeah. Uh, a way of escape. And so this gift of word of gift of knowledge, um, mm. he spoke. First he said, You're on the run. Mm. And he just stopped. You're on the run. Well, <clears throat> <laughs> you really were on who, the run. Who, who, <laughs> who knows about that <laughs> yeah. except my partners in crime? Yeah. And so that really didn't do it for me. But I was uncomfortable, and I just kind of played it off. He said, the second thing is, you're on the run from God. Well, I left my childhood faith yeah. when my mom was murdered, when we buried her in 1971, Christmas near Christmas Day. Yeah. And that got my attention. He differentiated between the two. You're on the run. That means from the law. Yeah. You're on the land. Uh, the second is you're on the run from God. That was true. Now I'm thinking, I, 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 I'm, I'm, I want a drink. I got to get home. I got to get out of here. And then as I was just getting ready to get up, he said, the third thing is you just came to the end of yourself. You just about ended it all. Mm -hmm. Two weeks to that day, I sat with a barrel of my rifle in my mouth. And I'm thinking, okay, yeah. this is really weird. It's getting really uncomfortable. I'm out of here. Yeah. I jumped up and went out. There were theater seats, the old theater seats. Yeah. And it was an old pizza hut. It was converted into a church. Okay. Um, and uh, I got up and I went to get out and, and to turn and go down the aisle to the, to the front door to get out of that building. Yeah. And I knocked my ex-girlfriend onto the floor in the aisle. I was in a hurricane of panic to get yeah. out of there. Yeah. And I was told, I don't remember this, but I was told that I ran to the door and put my hand on the, on the handle of the door, doorknob of the, of the door of the church to get out. And there was about like 60 people in that building. And they were all watching me, apparently. And I apparently turned on my heel, and I ran like a quarterback to the front of the church towards the pastor. And I don't remember that, but the church said it happened, so I believe it happened. My girlfriend said it happened, so I believe it happened. Wow. And I not quite reached the altar, the front of the church where the podium is, with the pastor behind it. And I just, I remember falling. I do remember falling on my face prostrate before the Lord. And I began to wail and cry out for mercy. And all I remember was this darkness began to come up out of my soul. And the stuff that was coming out of my mouth was not pure. Wow. It was just coming up. It was demonic. It was yeah. manifesting. And I was on my face and just wailing and weeping mm. in, in, in total disruption of this church service. And I remember feeling an arm around this shoulder. I remember an arm around this shoulder. Mm. And I remember one, I looked up and there's two old gentlemen, white-haired gentlemen, that accepted this stinky, off-the-street drug addict, mm. long matted hair, you know, mm. the biker image. Mm. And put their arms around me on their on their hands and knees in the front of that. This is the true picture of Jesus mm. reaching to the lost sheep. Amen. And uh, there were two brothers from Newfoundland, mm. uh, Hayward and, and Sid Spurl. I'll never forget the bro these mm. brothers were just sent by God. Mm. And they get down on their face and hands uh, on the on the floor with me and put their arms around me. I remember one whispering in my ear, "Brother, do you believe?" that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And I remember saying, yes. Mm. 
Do you believe that God is the creator of the universe and that Jesus is his? Ah, yes, I do. Instant, instantly, faith came into my spirit that morning by that word of knowledge that came by the Spirit of God, uncovered everything of darkness in my soul, mm. and I knew it was exposed before a holy God. Wow. And, and so I said, yes, yes. Would you like to make Jesus your Savior and your Lord today? Mm. Would you like to turn your back on the old ways of the enemy and the ways of the world? Yeah. And Christ would set you free. Would you want that today? And I kept saying, yes, <laughs> yes, <laughs> everything, yes, yes, <laughs> everything, yes. Yeah. And I, I didn't fully understand, yeah. but in my spirit, yeah. I knew it was yes. Yeah. Today is a yes day for me. Wow. And that morning they prayed the sinner's prayer. I followed through with them. That is simply ask Jesus to come into your life. Uh, forgive you of all your sins. Your yeah. slate will be clean. Yeah. And, you know, was, I wasn't free of everything. Yeah. But the desire um, for alcohol and drugs left. Yeah. And uh, that old way started, desire started to leave. It left. Yeah. Um, but for three more months, I kept testing the waters. I kept going back to the old friends. I kept going back to the old bootleg spots, the drug dealing spots, the pool hall, mm. and started drinking again and mm. smoking dope again. But you know, these things never had the, it didn't give me the satisfaction mm. it once did. Yeah. And I knew something had changed dramatically inside of me. Yeah. Three months later at a New Year's Eve party, uh, I'm walking home in a snow blizzard in jeans, T-shirt, and sneakers, and a friend picked me up, took me back to my dad's. Yeah. I had this new little Bible the preacher gave me. I'm reading the Bible. Yeah. And something clicks inside me. It's like, you know what? Those days are over today. Mm. It's not about turning a new leaf, but it's about a new start. Yeah. And it started that morning at the altar. Yeah. It's taking this three months to realize that you need the Lord and yeah. you need to set your course with Jesus. Amen. And so I did that. And I ended up at the church um, following Sunday. And we started from there. And me and my girlfriend got back together. Eventually we got married. Yeah. Had two children, a son and a daughter, Justin and Carrie. Yeah. And, uh, I got a full-time job, held a full-time job down at a hospital cleaner at a hospital. Yeah. It was a humble position, but it was a sure. it was it was good money, it was clean sure. money yeah. and um, honest money. Yeah. And you know the drug and alcohol desire left. Yeah. God delivered me, broke the chains of that. Yeah. And um, the criminal activity, I broke away from the old influences. Yeah. Although I must admit, I can't blame my old friends yeah. for the choices I made. We have to own the choices we make in life. If yes. we're really truly to get free, yeah. we need to own it. Yeah. We can't project our blame on other people. Even if it's true, in part, yeah. we're the ones that need to own it because we make our own choices. Really bad. So, um, got a little apartment. My wife and I got married. We had two kids mm. and uh, had this good full-time job. Mm. And then one day I had an operation at the hospital for a hernia. Mm. And... Um, I found out that the building was surrounded, the hospital was surrounded, my workplace was surrounded by uh, two detectives from Halifax and Calgary, Alberta, from the Homicide Squad, and uh, about 18, 20 RCMP, mm. uh, all exits were blocked. And it hit the ATV news that night, live at five, yeah. that I had been found and arrested for this unsolved murder 